O oh God of mercies, it is too good to be true. And yet it is true because you have declared it that you would look upon your son clothed in our sin and call us righteous. That you would transfer our guilt to his suffering and you would transfer your own righteousness to us by faith so that we could stand before you holy, blameless, with great joy. On that great day when your name is vindicated, we will not be incinerated, but we will be able to revel in, to delight in, to enjoy your radiating glory forever and ever. All by your grace, only by your mercy. Nothing we could do, nothing we could bring, but only because of your great love with which you loved us. And these things are too rich, too high, too lofty for us, and yet this is what you have done for us, and this is what you want us to know. Help us in these moments to understand your mercy all over again as we look at your word. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. You heard my father-in-law pray a few moments ago and uh, give thanks to God for Kim Maxwell being cancer-free. And that is just a tremendous thing. That's worth <laughs> giving thanks to the Lord for and uh, the answer to many prayers. Uh, for those of you who have battled cancer, you know that a cancer-free declaration uh, is not the end of uh, fighting cancer. She'll now be on the protocols that uh, go from weekly medications to uh, periodic checkups and things like that. Um, but the treatments dealing with her cancer are done, and that is something of a finish line. And um, we're very, very thankful for that. I want you to turn in your Bibles this morning to Romans 11. And we're continuing our study of this marvelous letter this explanation of the gospel. We find ourselves in this section in Romans 9 to 11 and here in chapter 11 where God's own promises are being defended. His integrity is being vindicated specifically in God's dealings with Israel. And I find that Romans 9 to 11 is something of a map that helps us to know where we are in redemptive history. If you've been to the mall, you no doubt have seen the map, or maybe you've looked for the map that has the intricate layout of all of the stores and all of the names and the hallways and passageways, and the X marks the spot that says, you are here. I need that. Outside, north, south, east, west, I can see where the sun is, I do fine. Inside a mall, and particularly inside a department store, I am lost as a goose and I've heard that engineers who design department stores design them intentionally with mirrors appropriately placed and uh, racks of clothing appropriately placed so that you don't know which way is out. <laughs> I'm serious, and, and it works on me. I, I don't know where things are. And, and if you can't find that sign that says, you are here, leading to the exit doors, if that's your desire... It can be very difficult to know where you are. And, and, and if you're stuck in one segment of a department store in a mall, going round and round and round, and all you see are shoes, you may not even be aware that there are lawnmowers and chainsaws somewhere in this store. Something of variety to look at. In terms of God's redemptive plan and the storyline of human history, it's important for us to know where we are. Where are we in God's plan? From our vantage point in salvation history, we may not really have a context for understanding how we fit in God's grand scheme. And the portion of the Bible we're looking at this morning is sort of a redemptive history, you are here, marker. Now turn to Romans chapter 11, if you have not already. And we see here that God has set apart and made promises to a nation to the nation of Israel. And Israel as a nation has rejected her own Messiah, the Messiah that would bring about those very promises. And in the meantime, Gentiles, non-Jews, 
have believed in Israel's Messiah in staggering numbers. And God even uses Israel's unbelief to bring about Gentile faith. But one day, God will bring Israel as a nation to repentance and faith in Messiah, and he will fulfill everything he has promised to her. Where are we in that storyline? We are right in between promise and fulfillment. God has promised things to Israel. By her unbelief, she has removed herself from the benefits of those promises for now. And in the meantime, we Gentiles get to benefit. (laughs) And there is a day coming when God himself will bring Israel to repentance and faith, and they too will benefit, and God will keep his promises. If we don't understand where we fit in this scheme of things, we we might lose track that there's a great deal more to what God is up to than us right here at Grace Bible Church in the 21st century. This is why it's so helpful to study church history. We recognize that there are Christians around the world and Christians over the eons who have faithfully pursued Christ and known Christ and been saved by Christ in different contexts. And if we zoom out a little further to all of biblical redemptive history, we understand there's a greater context than God's dealings with the church. He has been dealing, he currently is dealing, and he will deal with a special people selected out for his own purposes. And if we don't understand this, we get perhaps too high a view of our own importance as if we're the only players on the stage of redemptive history. We might even find ourselves to be theologically arrogant towards Israel. In fact, that is the exact application Paul has in mind in Romans 11, where he says, do not be arrogant toward the natural branches. We'll get there next week. I want to read our text this morning. We're looking at Romans 11, 11 through 16. And I want to read it by replacing the pronouns in this section with the reference of those pronouns. I suggested a couple weeks ago that that would be a very helpful exercise. Maybe you've gone home and done your homework and have read Romans 11, replacing all the he, she, it, they, them, our, we, us, all those pronouns, with the persons to whom they refer. If you've done that, you you would already have benefited from this exercise, but I'm going to read these verses doing that very thing. So read along with me, beginning in Romans 11, 11. God writes through the Apostle Paul, I say then, Israel, and we get Israel from the reference back in verse 7. You can look up there. What then? What Israel is seeking, it has not obtained. And then Paul picks that up in verse 11. I say then, Israel did not stumble so as to fall. Did Israel? May it never be. But by Israel's transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make, Gentile, to make Israel jealous. Now, if Israel's transgression is riches for the world and Israel's failure is riches for the Gentiles, how much more will Israel's fulfillment be? But I am speaking to you, that is Gentiles, Gentiles who are Gentiles, inasmuch then as I, Paul, am an apostle of Gentiles, I, Paul, magnify Paul's ministry, If somehow I, Paul, might move to jealousy my, Paul's fellow countrymen and save some of Israel, for if Israel's rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will Israel's acceptance be but life from the dead? If the first piece of dough is holy, the lump is also, and if the root is holy, the branches are too. And what becomes clear grammatically in Romans chapter 11, when we follow the pronouns and the reference of the pronouns, that Israel and the church are not the same. That Christian Gentiles do not absorb and eliminate Jewish identity. And in fact, there are distinct people and distinct nations in the millennial kingdom, which is to come. And there are distinct peoples and distinct nations even in the eternal state. And this is a significant aspect of God's grace in overturning his own judgment at the Tower of Babel. It was at the Tower of Babel where humanity was separated into languages and nations and peoples and locations. 
And God uses all of that to produce a variety and a diversity and ethnicity and food and art and culture and everything else that will then be brought under the lordship of Christ and celebrated for all of eternity. And Israel has not lost her ethnic identity any more than any of the other nations who show up in the eternal state have lost ethnic identities. Now we're going to see this morning some critical features of Israel's failure to believe in Messiah. Israel's failure to believe and embrace Jesus as the Messiah when he came. Israel's failure to believe in Messiah even down to our own day. That Israel has, as a nation, stumbled over the stumbling block. They've been scandalized. They've been tripped up. They have stumbled over salvation by grace through faith alone in Jesus the Messiah. And there are a number of reasons why this message and this person are a stumbling block for Israel. We've covered some of those already. But offering a free gift of salvation to those who feel like they have earned it is an offense. It's a threat to human pride. And offering Jesus a suffering servant in the place of an expected conquering king is a scandal. And the Jews could not stomach these things as a nation, even though these were the very things prophesied, promised in their own Old Testament scriptures. Let's look at Israel stumbling over the gospel this morning in Romans 11. First of all, we see that that stumbling over the gospel is partial, temporary, and purposeful. It is partial, temporary, and purposeful. Look what Paul says in verse 11. I say then, they did not stumble so as to fall, did they? May it never be. But by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them jealous. Paul says they didn't stumble so as to fall. And he offers a rhetorical question with that familiar Paul-like response, may it never be. God forbid. A very strong way to say, ain't no way. They did not stumble so as to fall. There is very clearly a stumbling. That word stumbling just simply means to trip, to lose your footing. James says we all stumble in many ways, right? Speaking specifically about our speech. We sin in our speech. James calls that a stumbling. But they did not stumble so as to fall. And fall here is the very common word to fall physically, to fall down, to forcibly fall to the ground. And used as a metaphor, it describes that which is completely ruined, to fall face down unto final condemnation. This is a description of irretrievable ruin or permanent failure. Is this the case for Israel as a nation? Yes, they've stumbled. Have they fallen to irretrievable ruin? And at times in history, it might have seemed so. And the moral condition of Israel as a nation today might lead us to believe so. But what is Paul's response? May it never be. Why? Because God will not be a liar. That is what is at stake in these verses, beginning in 9, 6. It is not as though the word of God has failed. You see, if Israel falls to utter ruin, then the word of God has indeed failed. Israel's keeping of God's promises, or rather God's keeping of his promises to Israel, is a matter of God's own integrity. And Israel's final repentance, as we will see in Romans 11, is a matter of the vindication of God's own integrity. And why, again, is this so important for us? Because God has made great promises to us, Christian. And you can bank on those promises because of the character of God, because of who he is. He does not lie. And he does not go back on his own covenant faithfulness. What does Paul say about Israel stumbling? It is partial, not total. It's partial, not total. He's, He's already covered that. Paul himself is a Jew. That's proof enough that Israel's failure, Israel's falling, is not a a total failure. There are Jews who believe. There was a a remnant in Paul's day. Uh, There is a remnant down to our own day. And this failure of Israel is not only partial, but it's also temporary. 
Israel's rejection by God is not the final word. Has God rejected them? Yes, but not forever. And not in a total sense. God is up to something with the nation of Israel, and he is not finished with them. Zechariah 12.10 stands. When they see him, that is when they see Jesus at his return, they will mourn for him as for an only son. That is, the Holy Spirit poured on the, out on them, gives them a heart of supplication, repentance, prayer, worship of the Jesus whom they as a nation rejected. They will love him. And God's promises are not only to give Israel the land and blessing that he promised, but also to give them new hearts in the new covenant which he promised to them. Now look down in chapter 11 at verse 27. Paul there quotes Jeremiah 31, this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. And again, the them and the there in verse 27 is still Israel. God made a promise to them that he will keep. And God's keeping of his promises is not separate from their repentance. In fact, it includes their repentance, is brought about through the vehicle of their own repentance. Israel's stumbling is partial and temporary, and it's also purposeful. God is up to something in this. Look at the second half of verse 11. By their transgression, by Israel's transgression, make no mistake, their rejection of Messiah is sin. It is the crossing of the boundaries of what God has set out for them. But by that vehicle, by their transgression... Salvation has come to the Gentiles. Salvation has come to the Gentiles by Israel's transgression. What a remarkable thing. For those of us in this room who are Gentiles who believe in Messiah, we believe in Messiah particularly in God's plan through Israel's rejection of Messiah. Think about this. It was Israel's rejection of Messiah because of the, the, the backslidden state of her spiritual condition that Jesus was actually crucified. Jesus was crucified because Israel rejected Jesus as her Messiah. And Jesus' own crucifixion is our only hope for forgiveness of sin. You and I are here today in a right relationship with God, in part because of Israel's rebellion. Humanly speaking, the cause of Jesus' crucifixion. And think about the rejection of the preaching of Messiah. The human cause of Gentiles hearing the gospel began in Acts chapter 8. You remember that in the book of Acts, the, the Holy Spirit was poured out and Jews had gathered into Jerusalem for a feast at Pentecost and they heard Peter preaching Jesus the Messiah and thousands repented on the spot and believed. Thousands of Jews from all over the Roman Empire believed the gospel. And then a persecution broke out in Acts 8 after the stoning of Stephen. Stephen. And they were scattered, Acts 8.1. Ostensibly back to the places they came from, places like Rome. Paul is writing this letter. He's never been to Rome. He's never preached the gospel in Rome. His missionary journeys have never yet taken him there, and yet there are Christians there in Rome. How did they get there? In part, because of Jewish antagonism against the preaching of Jesus as Messiah that scattered the church. They might have been happy just to stay there, stay in Jerusalem, thousands and thousands, a mega church on day one. They could have been comfortable. And the Lord said they would go from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the uttermost parts of the earth. Jewish antagonism to the gospel has been a cause of Gentiles hearing the gospel. Listen to Acts 13, 46. Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and said, it was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first, Jews, since you repudiate it and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. So Paul and Barnabas go to the Gentile world with the gospel. And this salvation to the Gentiles itself has a purpose in the economy of God. What is that purpose, second half of verse 11? By their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them, Israel, jealous. To make them jealous. You might be thinking, I don't know any Jews that are jealous of my believing in Jesus. 
right? But think about what the ground Paul has already covered back at Romans 10, 19. There he quoted Deuteronomy 32, and he said, surely Israel did not know. Moses says, I will make you jealous by that which is not a nation. By a nation that is without understanding, I will anger you. This is a jealousy, a a provocation produced by the fact that Christians all over the world today claim the rights and privileges of access to the God of the Old Testament, to the God of Israel, to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We sing, Father Abraham has many sons, and I'm one of them. And that is a provocation to Israel. It was a provocation in the first century. It has been one throughout church history. Now, the history of the Christian church, the so-called Christian church, has been a history of anti-Semitism, political, physical, theological. The, the, The church as an organized body, as an organized system, Um, has not provoked the Jews to jealousy in an open-armed, warm-hearted sense that says, please come to your Messiah whom we are enjoying. But that ought to be the message. That is the message of the New Testament. That is the message of genuine believers in Jesus Christ who have the heartbeat of the Apostle Paul and ache for Paul's countrymen to whom the promises were made. Salvation comes to the Gentiles by God's purpose to make the Jews jealous, something God said he would do. And and the provocation is designed in part because outsiders get to be insiders. What about those insiders who rejected the free gift? Would some of them turn? And some of you in this room have. And this shouldn't be a surprise. shouldn't be a surprise that Israel did not believe and shouldn't be a surprise that some Jews do believe. This was all part of God's revealed plan. These things weren't mysteries. They were promised. This isn't a plan you and I would come up with for Israel to reject the gospel so that Gentiles get in, so that Jews get jealous, so that they want in. (laughs) This was God's plan. And this stumbling over the gospel by Israel has a second feature. This stumbling anticipates future blessing. Look down at verse 12. Now, if Israel's transgression is riches for the world and their failure is riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their fulfillment be? Here's an argument from the lesser to the greater. It's an if-then statement. If there's this thing here now, then how much more will that other thing be later? Do you understand the logic of the argument? Now, let's think about the lesser part. Transgression, Israel's transgression, equals riches. And by riches here, Paul means all the riches that come with salvation in Jesus Christ. The riches of salvation for the world. Uh, The big, bad, broad world outside of Israel. And failure, failure of Israel, equals riches for Gentiles. Okay, that's the little part. And you're thinking, well, man, that's everything to me. If you're a Gentile believer here this morning, you're thinking, wow, who could ask for anything more? But that's the small part of the equation. And and if God does that small thing, then how much more is this bigger thing? And here's the anticipation of greater blessing. Here's the then statement, the lesser to the greater. Here's the greater. What will their fulfillment be? Just think about it. If Israel's failure now means all the riches for a world of unbelievers and salvation for us Gentiles who believe, how much more Israel's fulfillment It'll be better, immeasurably better. And fulfillment here is the same word, fullness, as we see down in verse 25. Look down there for a moment. I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, uninformed of this mystery. Why? So that you will not be wise in your own estimation that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until when? Until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Now, if you have any hope for the dough people, 
the fullness of the Gentiles has not come in. We know that the fullness of the Gentiles has not come in because there will be people surrounding the throne of the Lamb from every tongue and tribe and nation and people. God has his people marked out. We go find them by indiscriminate evangelism. We go find them by praying and laboring in missions and in our neighborhoods with the gospel. But the fullness of the Gentiles has not come in yet. And until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, there is a partial hardening of Israel. And this fullness of the Gentiles, this fulfillment of Gentiles, is the same word that shows up here in uh, verse 12, the fulfillment of Israel. In other words, there is a people in Israel set apart by God unto salvation. That's a subset of the nation set apart for God's purposes. But people that will believe the gospel, think about how much better it will be then if Israel's failure to believe the gospel as a nation produces such riches as you and I enjoy in Christ and will enjoy for all of eternity. How much greater will their fullness be when Israel lives up to everything they were designed to be by God's grace? Now listen, Paul's not shy about calling their rejection what it is. This fullness is set opposite to the words transgression and failure. Again, it is sin that Israel rejected Messiah Israel's fulfillment means their repentance or spiritual renewal, their national loyalty and faith to God and his Messiah. And if their transgression means salvation blessing to Gentiles, how much more will their fullness be? How much more what? How much more what, we should be asking? The answer to that is blessings, riches, salvation benefit. And to whom? In this verse, in this context, benefit to the world, benefit to the Gentiles. Paul's going to say, I'm writing to you Gentiles. <laughs> Why? Because as we'll see in a few moments, Israel's repentance benefits us Gentiles in ways we can't yet even imagine. Gentiles ought to be excited for Israel's national repentance. We ought to be longing for it, praying for it, eagerly anticipating Israel's national repentance. Why? Because as great as it is to be in Christ now through Israel's failure, how great will it be for us to be in Christ when Israel is fulfilled? That's Paul's argument. A third feature of Israel stumbling over the gospel is that it benefits Gentiles and preserves a Jewish remnant. Verses 12 to 14. Again, if their transgression is riches for the world, their failure is riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their fulfillment be? That is, God is actively saving Gentiles through it. We get the benefit. Paul goes on in verse 13, but I am speaking to you who are Gentiles. Inasmuch then as I am an apostle of Gentiles, I magnify my ministry if somehow I might move to jealousy my fellow countrymen and save some of them. What is the benefit for Gentiles in Paul, the Jew, preaching to the Gentiles the gospel of Israel's Messiah? We get salvation. But there's another benefit. There's a benefit for Paul. His ministry gets to be bigger and better, uh, glorified, literally magnified, made more wonderful. When he preaches the gospel to Gentiles, it is a fulfillment of what God said he would do in Deuteronomy 32, and Paul's hope is through that provocation, that moving to jealousy that Moses predicted, that some of them would actually believe. Paul knew that was true in his own life. He saw a number of the Pharisees in his own day come to faith in Christ. He preached the gospel in synagogue after synagogue, every town that he went to, and some believed. Many were hostile. Paul knew that his ministry to the Gentiles was a thorn in the side of his countrymen. But he says, my ministry to Gentiles is magnified, expanded, has added benefit in that it accomplishes what God said he would do in Deuteronomy 32, make Israel jealous by a not nation, and the result could be that some would be saved. That was Paul's hope, and it's what he actually saw in his own lifetime. This is a fulfillment of God's commitment to a faithful remnant among Israel. 
salvation benefits to the Gentiles, provocation of Israel as a nation, and salvation of some individual Jews, the remnant that God preserves in faithfulness. Paul knows that his own ministry is better if some Jews are saved through his ministry to the Gentiles. Listen, this solves or salves some of his own heartache for his own people who are trying to establish a righteousness of their own rather than submit to a free gift of righteousness and eternal life through Jesus the Messiah. Now, what you see here in verse 13, this or verse 14, some Jews being saved through proclamation of the gospel during the time of the Gentiles, or, or we might say the church age from Acts 2 onward. This is a trickle-in conversion of Israelites. This trickle-in throughout church age conversion is not what fulfills God's promises to Israel. Right? Some Jews believing the gospel is not the fulfillment of Jeremiah 31 promises or Deuteronomy 30 promises or Ezekiel 36 and 37 promises or a whole host of promises for Israel's spiritual renewal, return to the land, and material blessing uh, during the kingdom of Messiah's reign. Their incorporation into the church does not fulfill those promises. And by the way, notice the difference between what Paul says in verse 14. If somehow, by preaching the gospel in the church age, preaching the gospel to Gentiles specifically, I might save some Jews. That's way different than what is said down in verse 25 and 26. A partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, and then all Israel will be saved. It's a huge difference between a trickle in of some Jews in the preaching of the gospel and Israel as a nation repenting and turning and embracing Messiah. Those are two different events. One is present and an ongoing reality even in our own day, and the other is still outstanding yet future. There's a fourth aspect to Israel's stumbling, and it is that God does not cause Israel's stumbling to negate their special place in his redemptive plan. Israel's stumbling does not negate Israel's special place in God's redemptive plan. We see this in verses 15 and 16. If their rejection is reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? If the first piece of dough is holy, the lump is also, and if the root is holy, the branches are too. Again, this is an argument from the lesser to the greater. Israel's rejection leading to the reconciliation of the world. Listen, if, if things for us, again, us Gentiles in the world outside of Israel are so great and God used Israel's failure and rejection and transgression to bring about our salvation, how much better will it be when Israel believes and again, this argument from the lesser to the greater starts with some really great stuff. Think about Israel's rejection and the fruits of it in terms of world reconciliation. Think about the Samaritan woman in John 4, worshiping in the Ron Mountain, uh, having a cut and paste version of the scriptures, descended from those who mixed idolatry with the worship of Yahweh, separated from God, and Jesus comes to her so graciously and says, a time has come, time now is, when nobody will worship in that mountain or this mountain, but God seeks worshipers in spirit and in truth. Think of the Syrophoenician woman in Mark 7 from a land of idolatry who, who knows she doesn't deserve God's mercy and begs, can I just have crumbs from the table? And Jesus is gracious to her. To the Roman centurion in Matthew 8 or the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts 8. To Gentiles in the church at Rome. To the people of Spain who heard the gospel as Paul went from Rome to the rest of Europe. To Christians in North Africa and India. We believe the gospel went in all of those places in the first century. Think about the gospel going to British islanders who were cannibals and pagans before the gospel went there. 
Think about the Germanic pagans of Central Europe and the Norse people with all of their pantheon of idols. Eventually, after the degradation of the church and the obscuring of the gospel, during the Reformation, a new impulse for gospel expansion came. Gospel persecution and gospel going to the ends of the earth, the modern missions movement, and the peoples indigenous to North and South America heard the gospel and believed. Navajo, Cherokee, the Delaware Indians under David Brainerd's ministry, the Quechua, the Yananomi, and the Huichols in Central and South America. The cannibals of Vanuatu believed. The peoples of India, Indonesia, and Iraq, the Philippines, Finland, and France, South Africa, and Singapore, New Zealand, Namibia, and Nepal. The gospel has gone to people's all over the face of the earth. And there's still much work to be done. The lesser part of this argument, if Paul is moving again from the lesser to the greater, the lesser is pretty great. And what is the greater part? It must be something even yet greater. Look at verse 15. If Israel's rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will Israel's acceptance be but life from the dead. Life from the dead. This is a spiritual renewal. The spiritual renewal of Israel and and a worldwide blessing that will come with Israel's acceptance. That will occur when the nation believes the gospel, when they have eternal life, spiritual life. And when they do, the world will experience a radical renewal of its own. And, And by that, we mean the physical world. The earth we live on now, not the new heavens and the new earth, but the present earth will experience a radical transformation when Israel believes. And the benefits to Gentiles, to people of every tongue and tribe and nation and people will be monumental. The phrase life from the dead here is not the word normally used for resurrection as in bodily physical resurrection. This is the word used in the New Testament for spiritual life. Romans 6, 4, same word is used. Those of us who have been united to Christ in his death have also been united in his life. We now walk in newness of life. This is spiritual life. It is resurrection life on the inside, new birth, a life that transcends physical death. I want you to see the promises that God made to Israel about this very thing. In fact, I believe that when Jesus was speaking with Nicodemus, Jesus called Nicodemus in John 3, the teacher of Israel. In fact, he rebuked him. He said, you're the teacher of Israel, and you don't know what I'm talking about when I speak about new birth? (laughs) Nicodemus, you should have known. And I think Jesus is referring specifically to Ezekiel 36 and 37, where God would pour out his Holy Spirit and sprinkle Israel clean of heart by his Holy Spirit. Listen to the promises God made in Ezekiel 36 beginning in verse 22. Therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord Yahweh, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for my holy name. Do you get it already? This is about grace, not what is deserved. My name you have profaned among the nations where you went. I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. Then the nations will know that I am Yahweh, declares the Lord Yahweh, when I prove myself holy among you in their sight. For I will take you from the nations, gather you from all the lands, and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. You will live in the land that I gave to your forefathers so you will be my people and I will be your God. Moreover, I will save you from all your uncleanness. I will call the grain and multiply it. I will not bring a famine on you. I will multiply the fruit of the tree and the produce of the field so that you will not receive again the disgrace of famine among the nations." Then you will remember your evil ways and your deeds that were not good. 
and you will loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and your abominations. I am doing this for your sake, declares the Lord Yahweh. Let it be known to you, be ashamed and confounded for your ways, O house of Israel. Thus says the Lord Yahweh, on the day that I cleanse you from all your iniquities, I will cause the cities to be inhabited. The waste places will be rebuilt. The desolate land will be cultivated instead of being a desolation in the sight of everyone who passes by. They will say, this desolate land has become like the Garden of Eden. And the waste, desolate, and ruined cities are fortified and inhabited. Then the nations that are left round about you will know that I, Yahweh, have rebuilt the ruined places and planted that which was desolate. I, Yahweh, have spoken and will do it. Do you understand that the spiritual promises to Israel are inextricably linked with physical land promises as well? They go together. And these are promises still yet outstanding. You think, how how will the Lord do this? How does God take a nation so fallen away from the truth, so fallen away so as to have murdered Messiah and rejected his work for so long? How will God do such an astounding thing? Well, Ezekiel 37, the very next chapter, tells us. And this is the vision that God gives to Ezekiel of the valley of the dry bones. And we can't read all of it here, but... You remember that God put Ezekiel in front of a field of skeletons and said, can these live? And Ezekiel says, I don't know. Only you know. Ezekiel, prophesy to these bones. Prophesy to the breath. And what happens? God breathes and ligaments and sinews form and bones join and an army of people is raised out of a field of bones. Life is given to that which is dead. This is a metaphor throughout Scripture about how God brings about eternal life from nothing. Jesus told the dead man Lazarus to walk out of the grave, and he did. You were dead in your transgressions and sins, Ephesians 2, but God made us alive, Ephesians 2, 5. And Ezekiel 36 and 37, Israel is spiritually dead And God makes them alive. God promises he will do this. When will Israel as a nation repent? When will they believe en masse? When will they experience this radical conversion? This will take place during the great tribulation. God will first raise up 144,000 Jews, 12,000 from each tribe, to know and believe the gospel and then to preach the gospel. Gentiles will believe during that time. And eventually, the entire nation of Israel that is left, that survives the great tribulation, will be believers when Jesus returns in Revelation 19. That day is coming. And that day will usher in a thousand-year reign of Jesus the Messiah on the earth. Listen to Zechariah 12. I quoted this earlier, verse 10. I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication so they will look on me. They will look on me, Yahweh, whom they have pierced and mourn for him as for an only son. Zechariah 13, 1. In that day, a fountain will be opened for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and impurity. They'll experience forgiveness. Zechariah 14, 9, the Lord will be king over all the earth, and in that day the Lord will be the only one, and his name the only one, which is a striking feature right after Antichrist's anti-ministry, where he declares himself to be the only one, and he's thrown alive into the lake of fire, and Jesus comes down to the earth and installs himself as king rightfully over all the earth. Zechariah 14, 11, people will live in it and there will no longer be a curse for Jerusalem will dwell in security. Zechariah 14, 16, it will come about that any who are left of all the nations that went against Jerusalem will go up from year to year to worship the king, Yahweh of hosts, and to celebrate the feast of booths. What is Zechariah predicting? That Israel actually will be the center of Yahweh worship. Israel will be the center of Jesus worship on the day that he reigns from Jerusalem over the earth. That day is coming. 
And Israel's repentance and spiritual renewal will usher in a worldwide submission to Jesus as king. And for a thousand years, there will be blessings through Israel to all the nations, just like God promised in Genesis 12 to Abraham. World peace, Satan locked up, and Israel as a nation living out her mandate. But the prayers of Jews and Gentiles alike will be answered. You know the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray? Your kingdom come. It's not here yet. It needs to come. And Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Let it come. And the second part of that prayer, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That day is coming. And God does it by bringing a Messiah that Israel would reject, that Gentiles would believe in, that would provoke, provoke Israel to jealousy. Some Jews get saved and are incorporated into the church. Jew, Gentile, no distinction, equal footing in the church. But a day is coming when Israel nationally will repent and believe and Jesus will return and usher in that best era of human history that has ever been seen, right after the worst era that human history will ever have seen. Ultimately leading to the new heavens and the new earth. Verse 16, Paul gives two illustrations the first is bread, the second is a tree. They're both illustrating the same thing. The first batch of dough, literally the first fruits, is a reference to Leviticus 25, uh, and, it, and it specifically refers here to the patriarchs, uh, the very first installment of faithful Israelites. God set them apart as holy. And, and Paul says, if the first fruits are holy, then the whole batch is holy. You would bring in the first fruits of your grain offering and offer it to the Lord as a way to say, God, you provided all of this. Really, all of our grain belongs to you. It's all from you. It's all through you, and it's all ultimately to you. And so if the patriarchs of Israel are holy, all of Israel is holy. Second illustration is roots and tree. The roots are the patriarchs again, and we find out that specifically later in, in chapter 11. If the roots are the patriarchs and the tree is Israel, you don't separate a, a, a root uh, from the rest of the tree. It's not as if the tree could exist without the roots or a root ball would be anything without the tree. They go together. We're going to find out that branches are cut off for unbelief, but the tree is Israel and the tree is holy. By the way, every use of the word branches in subsequent verses in this chapter is only spoken of Israel. No doubt that this is speaking of Israel. And the two illustrations point to the same thing. Holiness here is not moral purity. Don't be confused. Israel today is not holy in the sense that they love the Lord the God, their God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. No, they're in rebellion, active rebellion against the gospel currently. But holiness in terms of being set apart and specifically set apart for God's purposes. There's another way to think through these verses, uh, a second way to sort of outline this. Instead of verse by verse, you might think about it as uh, past, present, and future. What did God do with Israel in the past? What is he doing presently? Presently, they're in transgression, a partial hardening. They are in failure. They have stumbled, but not fallen to utter ruin. There's a remnant, there's a provocation to jealousy. Some believe, and in the future there's a day coming in a national repentance that will usher in blessings for the world. Let me give you seven takeaways from what we learn here about God's dealings in redemptive history through Jews and Gentiles. Number one, there's no place for anti-Semitism. Not politically, not theologically, not personally. Just like all forms of prejudice and racism and xenophobia and ethnocentrism, right? There, there's no place for that. It's just all sin, right? And, and there's no category for Christians to look at Israel's rejection of Messiah and do as many in church history have done and said, they're Christ killers, therefore they're persecutable, right? That's wickedness. There's no place for that. And there's no place for a, a theological anti-Semitism, that has a, an unfair bias against Israel because of her rejection, we must let God's word stand. A second takeaway, share the gospel with every Jew you meet. 
and share the gospel with every Gentile you meet. A third takeaway. Remember that God uses evil for good. Listen, this is Israel's transgression on display here, and it is the vehicle by which God has brought blessing into your own life. Does God know how to take evil and accomplish good? Of course he does. He's bigger and stronger than all of it, and ultimately they all serve him. Think about the fact that Satan indwelt Judas in order to get Jesus murdered. What Satan intended for evil, God meant for good from before the foundation of the world. The fourth takeaway, trust in God's promises. That's what this whole section is about. God keeps his promises to Israel, therefore you can believe and trust Romans 8. Trust in his promises. Even when it looks like things aren't working out, trust him. A fifth takeaway, recognize the important ways in which the past and the future govern our lives. God has given us history accurately, and he's given us future history accurately, and he reveals them to us so that we might think rightly, think rightly about ourselves, think rightly about our place in redemptive history, think rightly about the world around us. Let God's revealed future govern your lives the way the Bible intends. Your theology matters, your eschatology matters. Number six, there's no boasting. Why does God reject Israel for unbelief, bring Gentiles in through that unbelief, use Gentile belief to provoke Israel ultimately to belief? Why does he save that way? Well, listen, if we Gentiles were outsiders and we got in by the mercies of God, we say, I don't belong here. What am I doing here? How did I get saved? And if Jews who always believed that they were in automatically, oh, we've got Abraham as our father. We've got the book of Moses. If God says you're cut off for unbelief. Now, what does the apostle feel When he sees the risen Christ and is brought in by grace, he says, oh, the mercy of God. I was cut off for unbelief and now I'm in. I don't belong here. He calls himself the the chief sinner and the least of all the apostles. He can't believe that he's a Christian. And that's the point. That is the grand climax that this section of Romans is pushing us to. Romans 11, 33 to 36 is that doxology, that burst out in song that Paul makes where he says, oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. Nobody knows his ways. From him, through him, and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever, amen. And then 12, 1 turns on all of that and says, therefore, in view of the what? Mercies of God. This is the grand climax of the exposition of the gospel in the book of Romans. Mercy, mercy, mercy. And Gentiles who get in, get in not because they deserved it, but because God was merciful. And Jews get in, not because they deserved it, but because God was merciful. And so we uphold the no boasting clause of the gospel. Number seven, last one this morning. Marvel at God's mercy. Just marvel at it. Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to the cross I cling. God, would you save me? Let's pray. God, thank you for these words. Thank you for the reminder of your good news. Rejected by some that others might believe. God, you get to be just and the justifier of all who put their faith in Christ. You get to be merciful, though every single one of us, every Jew, every Gentile, is fully deserving to be let go our own way, to be ignored, to be neglected, to be condemned. If you were to let us all enter into judgment forever, you would be just but you've sought to put your mercy on display, your desire to be kind to the undeserving, to save by grace all who would cry out to you in faith. And we would pray for any here this morning who do not yet know you. May they find this grace, this love, this mercy in your son. And we pray it in his name.
Amen.